It was really interesting to do, and I, I spent a lot of time going down rabbit holes and trolling and thinking, surely somebody's done this before, and contacting various people. And look, John Chu was fantastic on this because he's an economist and he's really involved in the sector. And I said, John, surely somebody's done this. And anyway, he, he looked at what we did and thought it was you know reasonable kind of approach. Hi, I'm Dirk Mona, founder of The Koala News, and I'm coming to you from Perth, Western Australia. G'day, and I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society, coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. A little bit later on the show, we've got Chris Zaguris from Melbourne, who's going to be joining us to talk about the international student levy, a hot topic out there in the industry. But Dirk, another week, another review. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? This is now number four, I believe. So previously, we had the University of Accord. We've had the Nixon Review, the Fast Review, and then the Migration Review, and now we've had the inquiry into tourism and international education's interim report handed down another 29 recommendations and i tell you what thank the lord above that we now use pdfs and not paper because i tell you there'll be quite a few trees going if this is being printed out around the country mate really in-depth report it's incredible and and a really interesting read i gotta say it's a very thorough document and um from a, re- a reading point of view, the government's spared sort of nothing to, to go into the finite details, so it's been great. But one thing that really stands out to me, though, and I, I wrote about it earlier, uh, or just after it was it was uh, released, was the fact that tourism doesn't really get much of a go. If you look at the terms of reference of, of the review, tourism was 50% of the review, and, and what they've decided to do as a, as a government is to release the international education portion of that in a fast way, which I get on one hand. There's a lot of work going on in international education, so to see that fast track is really good. What I guess I'm really concerned about is that we, we miss that whole nexus with the tourism industry, and it's a really big one. I'm glad you explained that because when I went through the recommendations that came out of that report... I hadn't picked up on the fact that this was only the international education portion. I'm like, where's the tourism stuff? I I did pick up on some of those, some of the numbers that you put in the Koala News episode this week around the the amount being spent on tourism versus versus international ed, which of course continues to to, to bother me and everybody else in in international education. Fifty seven million spent on tourism, a paltry six or seven on on international ed, even though international ed continues to deliver much greater benefit in economic terms yeah. to the country. Oh, you're right. It's 11.8% of what tourism gets is the international education budget, and it delivers 68% of the total return on investment, total wow. spend of tourism. Look, it's a key fact. But beyond that, I think it goes even bigger than that, right? This now opens the discussion around how do we fund international education? What's our strategy? Is it a growth strategy or, or is it not? When you compare that, there's another line in the document that talks about what the British Council spends. Now, I know comparing it to the British Council is probably a little bit of a rough thing to do, but mate, they, they spend annually £175 million, which equates to £335 million, and that's just on the British Council endeavours. So when you compare the two, it's pretty astounding in, in terms of the way we fund things and the return on investment, and one could then say how well international education does and how much it punches above its weight. So, so it's a fascinating area. It punches so far about above its weight. We, we, we all know that. Maybe let's get into some of the specific recommendations. There are 29 of them. I've got some here that interested me, but which were the ones that sort of stood out to you? I think the big one for me, the, or the one that I picked up on in another story was around this whole Team Australia notion. It's, it, it runs as a theme throughout the document. And I always, look, for the one of a better, better phrase, I think we do pretty well as Team Australia I think we've had some hiccups over the years and in terms of branding. I think if you remember back maybe 10 years ago, there was a big push about removing the kangaroo from all, you know, all of our literature and those sorts of things. Amazing. Could you imagine Canada without a maple leaf? Hmm. So when you track that back and you start thinking about Team Australia, what does that actually mean? And a whole of government approach to things has been spoken about for quite some time, you know, aligning migration with promotion, aligning education policy development with promotion and migration, and how do these things come together? So in, a, in another piece that I've written about, it's more around, is it now time for us to consider what an international portfolio might mean for Australia? Something like an Education Australia, likened to the British Council, and how would that be constructed and how would that go? And if you look at some of the subpoints of the of the inquiry, Foreign Affairs obviously had a, quite a large say. So Foreign Affairs obviously runs a new Colombo plan. I mean, where does that fit into Team Australia and how is that coordinated? Another big one 
was around alumni engagement and how do we actually harness the soft power that our alumni can achieve once they're finished and they return to their, their home countries. And everyone knows uh, there's great examples of, say, the Singaporean or the Thai governments having Australian graduates in their parliaments. How do we do that in a more constructive or a more systematic way? So having, you know, there's definitely, I think, a point there for having a, an international portfolio that becomes an Australian government department that specifically looks at international education. And off the back of that, if I can say, how much easier would it be for when these reviews are conducted that they're done in a singular manner? So the sector has one department to talk to, and then that department and that minister can then have those discussions around the cabinet table and within government. So it becomes a lot easier, I think, or a lot more simplistic um, for the sector to be able to feed back to government about what needs to be done. So I think there's a lot to be said about, about at least considering at this point with the amount of reviews going on, a point of which a singular international education portfolio in department could really benefit the country. It does feel a little bit like deja vu. I feel like we've spoken about this whole of government approach probably for the better part of 20 years. Back in the early 2000s, AEI was quite a known and very active player and, and I felt like it was getting to that point where whole of government was really going to happen. And I don't know, it just seems to keep ticking over. So it was encouraging to see that sort of language back in this report and right up top as well. You're absolutely right, Rob. When we start thinking about 10 years ago, I think it was in 2010, Australia actually took over the promotion of Australian education from AEI. And it was a really bold move at the time and one that the sector considered not necessarily the best move because it moved Australia from having a commercial kind of reputation already into having a hyper-commercial reputation by putting education into the trade arm. So again, when we talk about the reviews, when we talk about the overly commercial approach and the effect that might have on some of the behaviours of student flows, again, having a centralised department whose focus isn't just on export dollars, but is genuinely on educational cooperation, um, makes a lot of sense at this point. We might just stay on this for a couple more minutes because this this really was a, a, a very significant report. Some of the things that stood out to me were talking about things like creating a framework around work integrated learning, something that could be apply across many institutions just to create a bit more clarity as to what those sorts of experiences should look like. They touched on a whole bunch of things like accommodation, skill shortages, the visa differentiation for TAFE just to help with reporting. It seems like such a micro thing, but it actually made it into this report. Once again, coming back to what you said, they've actually covered a lot of terrain. They have, and it's really interesting because there's a lot of this, I think, that kind of exists at the moment. From my way of thinking, and certainly from someone who's, who's looked at stats uh, through my own writing over the last three or four years, I've always thought that I could dissect TAFE from the private sector. There is a tab in the Australia or in the AEI data, which is presented by Australia in the pivots, where you can actually drop down government or non-government providers of vet providers of vet of vet education providers. So from my point, I think that data is already there. I'm not sure that it needs a completely separate visa. Maybe I'm missing something and the government knows something more than what I did. And that's that's fine. Yeah, possibly. All the stuff in there I thought was interesting. I picking up on this issue around ABNs international students essentially working using an ABN, so going in as contractors, that was really interesting. Clearly, they've got some information there about potentially international students being exploited or otherwise. And to actually loop in an issue like that into a report like this, I thought was an interesting inclusion. And then a really good one, I, I, I love this one, is about including agents and the student experience in the quilt data, the quality indicators of learning and teaching data. So uh, for those not familiar with it, it's a data set collected by Australian government every year that looks at the student experience. It looks at employer perceptions of higher education experiences and graduations and graduates. It's a fantastic, absolutely fantastic data set. But yeah, like looping in student experience with international agents, I thought was quite an interesting suggestion. What it essentially does is signal the fact that a student's experience doesn't start when they come on shore. And I think that's a really important one because I think it, certainly at a university level and I know in a lot of other sectors, that the first touch of the student is where the journey begins, not when they come on shore. There's a whole bunch of preparatory work that needs to be done before a student can even make a choice, before they start a visa process, etc. So for the government to acknowledge that, I think it's a positive thing. How that plays out in quilt data, I'm not sure necessarily that's the right spot for it, but, but it's interesting and it's good that the government's wanting to see feedback on the start of the student experience rather than just the start of the student experience onshore. 
Now, one of the things that came up when I was talking with people at the AIC conference a couple of weeks ago, a lot of sort of concerns about what this is going to mean in terms of workload and compliance. Do you have a sense of how much, they, if, if the government were to adopt a lot of these recommendations, what kind of additional compliance requirements are going to be loaded onto institutions? Yeah, the key word there is if and how much is going to be implemented. What we generally see from these reviews is that when after the government responds, that will become a lot clearer. Certainly in terms of if a lot of this is implemented, it can't be implemented overnight, obviously. So there'll be a stage progress of that. But look, a lot of these things are a step in the right direction. And a lot of these things are the things that we should be doing. You're right, though, there's going to be an impact on compliance. There's going to be an impact on the way in which institutions and institutions right across all sectors need to organise themselves to be compliant. So there will be an impost. How that turns out in terms of reporting or whether this is good practice that institutions should be doing anyway, it's really hard to tell, really hard to tell. So I was reading recently, Dirk, in your in one of your reports, uh, a few troubles going on in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a few things that are going on. Firstly, the Canadian government's got itself into a Certainly a big pickle with India at the moment. India is the largest source country for Canada and you look to backtrack and to summarise and to try not to step on any landmines that might upset either country. Canada essentially, through the Prime Minister Trudeau, accused India of playing a part in a, the, the death of a prominent Indian in British Columbia. The Indians flatly deny it. And since that case, each country, I guess, has had a bit of a standoff uh, with each other to the point where foreign affairs staff from each country have been recalled and visa processing has been wound back. On Friday, however, there was an announcement by the Indian government or the Indian High Commission in Ottawa and their posts in each of the major cities in Canada that visa processing for Canadians seeking to go to India will recommence. And that's a really positive thing, I think, in, in their bilateral relationship and a positive thing for global players watching. It's turned out that at present, the Canadians only have five staff processing visas in, in India at the moment. Wow. Which is amazing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right? wow. Wow. And I believe it's been reported that uh, of 38,000 visa applications that will be processed, they're looking at maybe, hopefully, getting through 20,000 of them. So there's going to be some significant backlogs, in, certainly in terms of Indian students seeking Canada. Numbers are staying firm, but there's definitely some informal feedback that people are starting to get a little bit nervous about it. So whether people are starting to, families in Delhi and Mumbai and in other places are starting to look for a second destination as an option in case their Canadian visa doesn't get processed, will be an interesting to, thing to watch over the next few months. But certainly we'll be watching the numbers of, of visa processing and the number of staff that return to India from Canada to be able to get rid of that backlog and to see that relationship hopefully return to somewhat normal because it's, it's not good when those ripples occur. And there was a second announcement coming out of Canada where their minister, I think it's Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, if I hope I haven't got that wrong, actually made some announcements on Friday. What Canada's doing is moving to a letter of acceptance verification system. So up until this point, and I might, actually I might backtrack and say from the Australian perspective, we provide a letter of, a letter of offer and once that acceptance come in, we put something into a prison system. Prisoners as they can then be checked by border or by visa officers in country to make sure that student is bona fide. In Canada, that hasn't taken place up until this point. So they're now moving wow. to a, a system which is similar to, to our prison system. And it's like I said, it's a letter of acceptance verification system. So that's a huge move by the Canadians and one which I think will benefit them significantly. Unbelievable to think that a letter of offer can be presented to a visa office, it not be verified and a visa be granted based upon a letter that's not verified in any way. Incredible up to this point. A really strong move from the Canadians in, in that sense. It, it almost sends shivers down your spine, doesn't it? To think that it's 2023. And uh, that's not yet in place. Goodness gracious. It, it does. Yeah. Okay. Should we bring in our guest? We shall. Looking forward to this one. Joining us is Chris Zaguris, who's a professor in higher education at the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education. He's also a former past president of the International Education Association of Australia. So somebody who knows quite a lot about not only higher ed, but international higher education. And he's recently co-authored a paper on the proposed international student levy. Chris, thanks for joining us on Global Horizons. Thanks, Rob. Great to be here with you. 
Thanks, Mike. Chris, there's a lot going on in reviews in the international education space at the moment. Somewhat confusing for, for, for some people. Can you tell us just a, broadly a little bit about the university's accord and where it fits into, in, into the scheme of things? Sure. Look, I guess in historical context, what we've got is a a relatively new Labor government who likes to be at the forefront of higher education system changes. And so it's implemented a a big review of effectively everything about higher education now. The Accord panel is looking at at a whole lot of different aspects of the university system. So it's been going since early this year. They uh, produced a discussion paper in the the first quarter of the year, an interim report around the middle of the year. There's been a series of submissions from all the stakeholders and they're due to report the recommendations to the minister by the end of this year. So we're kind of in the getting to the business end of things. And uh, you've honed in on one particular part of the Unis Accord potential levy for international students. What's what's that about, very briefly? Yeah, so look, the idea was suggested by two universities in, in submissions earlier this year, by uh, UTS and Newcastle, uh, who uh, kind of pointed out that um, you know, under the current model, the government uh, sort of expected universities to raise funds from international students in order to uh, cover the cost of research and infrastructure and so on. That's all very well for those universities that can raise funds from international students, but those who don't or can't because they're in regional locations especially and and other reasons, they're really at a disadvantage. And so they proposed a levy or a tax on international student fees that would be redirected to those institutions, those universities that, that didn't get enough revenue from international students. So that's basically the idea that was put forward in the interim report of the the panel in the middle of the year. They presented this idea as one that they were considering and without a lot of detail about it. And then the ministers also mentioned it a couple of times. And so, yeah, it's very unclear whether it's going to come to fruition, but yeah, it would have big implications, So, which is why we decided to take a look at what that idea is and what it would mean. You've written a really, really comprehensive really? report and, and an article for The Conversation as well, along with colleague Gwil, Gwil Croucher. Fantastic report. Do you maybe want to give a, a broad outline of some of the things that you've been thinking about, that both of you have been thinking about in relation to the proposed levy? Sure. So we, I guess the first thing we did is just look at that, the, the, the difference in international student numbers between different institutions and sort of the, the imbalance, I guess, in that spread. And there's, there's clearly five universities with, with many more international students or, and more revenue than, than any of the other universities. And they are University of Melbourne, uh, Monash, Sydney, UNSW and UQ. They also happen to be the five biggest universities overall. They're also the biggest for domestic students and um, uh, and the biggest with international numbers and, and largest revenues and so on. So they're the big five universities. So we looked at that a little bit, the, the state of that imbalance. Then one of the things we did was look at what the existing levies are. And so there's, there's some levies on international student fees in Australia and New Zealand already. We look at how they operate and... You know, so there's a tuition protection scheme for private providers, which you know, provides students with refunds and, and support if their provider goes broke, basically. Yeah, there's another cry cost levy to raise funds for administration of the prison system and so on. And New Zealand has a levy that's a bit more comprehensive that funds pretty much those things plus international marketing of New Zealand as a destination and so on, but it's relatively small. But what they all have in common, that's it's a small pot of money and they're used to fund things directly related to international students. Yeah? And so they kind of make sense and they've been pretty uncontroversial, those levies. What's proposed here is much bigger. Those levies raise, you know, in the millions of dollars or perhaps you know, maybe 10 or the tens of millions. The quantum that's being talked about, as far as we can tell, is around half a billion dollars uh, to be raised out of this levy, which would mean something like 5% of the existing fee. So $1 out of every 20 that international students would pay to a university would go into a pot. So it's way bigger. And also the expenditure that's being proposed is not anything related to international students. They're proposing to use international students' fees to pay for research and infrastructure at 
largely at institutions that international students don't go to in great numbers. So yeah, the so that's we looked at those existing levies. And the other thing we did at the outset was to look at how much international students already contribute to government funds through income tax, GST and visa charges. And it works out to, I think, $2.6 billion that we added up. You know, it's a simple calculations based on what the research says about what proportion of international students work, how many hours do they work, if they were getting paid minimum wage, they'll be paying these sorts of taxes. So that sort of calculation. But, you know, it's in the ballpark, it's in the billions of dollars that, that international students are already contributing. And they don't really have access to most government services that the rest of us as citizens, permanent residents do have access to. Yeah. I, I reckon that table alone is worth anyone listening to this going and grabbing that report and going and looking it up. It's on page seven, and the two point six billion dollars is broken down into those areas that you've just you've just mentioned. That I found to see that laid out. That's the first time I've actually seen those numbers laid out. I found that fascinating and and shocking to some extent. Too. Yeah, it was really interesting to do. And I, I spent a lot of time going down rabbit holes and trawling and thinking, surely somebody's done this before and contacting various people. And look, John Chu was fantastic on this because he's an economist and he's really involved in the sector. And I said, John, surely somebody's done this. And, and anyway, he, he looked at what we did and thought it was, you know, reasonable kind of approach. Interestingly enough, Chris, I guess you speak a little bit about New Zealand and then having a marketing budget in that. I know outside of your paper, but since the inquiry into tourism and international education, there is a recommendation for a levy for marketing funds. How do you see that pairing into the work that you've done in the accord process? Yeah, look, it's interesting, isn't it, that the the government's got lots of ambitions, but it's fiscally constrained, I guess, and they've promised tax cuts. So they're looking everywhere for money and international students are, uh, are, are a pot of gold there in the eyes of government at the moment. Yeah, look, it's, uh, there's going to be a bit of competition between these two ideas. I don't know if the government could or you know, would implement two different levies on international students at the same time using different mechanisms, but it's the same logic in both cases, isn't it? Yeah, it's, to me, it, it really stood out to, to be something, particularly with the pushback. I think, you know, the sector really pushed back against this idea. And, you know, you used the word earlier, that the TAX word, and it's been bandied around quite a bit. And, and to see it now, I guess, put into a different context around the promotion of, of Australian international education, it's got me thinking around, well, where does promotion even sit now? And if we're going to start thinking about a levy, where does that money go to? I know the, the report talks a little bit about the governance of that sort of money, but how does that then get played out? And they're really, really big questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, the, the New Zealand levy works pretty well, I think, because it's very transparent. So every year there's a financial report about how much money was collected from which institutions, where it was spent, you know, with a detailed breakdown. It's administered by Education New Zealand that's very you know, accountable to the sector and to the government. And so that's a nice model there, but it's much less clear how any of these levies in Australia would work. Yeah, and look, interestingly, the, the IEAA in its response to the interim report of the, the accord, the IEAA's response was, look, we're not really in support of a levy like this, but if there were to be a levy, it would be much better if it was to be used for purposes directly related to international students yeah, <laughs> and that are going to benefit international students. And, you know, you sure, maybe spend some of it on marketing, but you'd maybe spend some of it on student welfare grants or on yeah. scholarships, mental, mental health, health support. support, all those things that are going to benefit students. Yeah, given that they are the ones contributing to this pot. And if it's a form of tax, provide services for them based on the, the what they're contributing to the uh, to the system. What risks do you see in this, Chris? If, if something like this were to be implemented? I think there's there's a couple. One is the, the reputational risk to Australia. And so already that, that there's the, there is that sense widely held that international students are treated as cash cows. You know, that's a, a, sen a sentiment that in many international students have, but also it's, it's pervasive among the domestic population, which is really corrosive, that, that view, that the reason that international students are here is for their money. It just completely, uh, you know, dissolves all the other 
reasons why international students are recruited and, and come to study here. But at the moment, international students choose which institutions to study at. There's very different levels of fees and programs and services, and the students are kind of making a voluntary choice to pay that level of fees for the service that they're providing. And so it's a voluntary exchange. They may wish that they the fees were lower, but you know, it's a voluntary thing. When the government steps in and starts taking international students' fees and spending it on other purposes that the international students aren't choosing, then it's it's effectively the the government treating those students as cash cows quite overtly because it you know when the institutions collecting the fees, the institutions are deciding where to spend those funds and the students are choosing the institutions and so that's that's really potentially corrosive I think on our reputation. And not just for international students, but also for the way that domestic students and everybody else sees uh, international education. The second kind of major risk is in terms of uh, affordability of Australia and the number of students. So let's say it's a 5% tax, something like that. The universities are going to have to decide whether to hand over 5% 5% of the international student revenue to Canberra and take a hit, which in you know in the case of University of Sydney, I think is over $60 million, that would be. So they would have to cut wages and services to the tune of $60 million to hand that money to the Commonwealth, which would be a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people's livelihoods affected and a lot of services affected. The alternative is to raise fees by 5% and, and keep that revenue. And that's, you know, that's a significant increase in fees, which would reduce the affordability of, of institutions. And so it's either going to be a big financial hit to, to the universities, or it's going to be a big financial hit to, to students. And I think there'll be a sharing of that cost between the institutions. But I, look, I think the universities will try to pass on as much as possible of that 5% to students in increased fees, which will uh, potentially lower the number of students um, because of that cost. I've surprised that a lot of the discussion um, so far by advocates assumes that this is free money. You know, it, it's money that can be taken from place A to place B. It's not going to have any impact because there's so much <coughs> revenue for those institutions. We can take that away with really zero cost. It's not going to affect students. They won't know. It's not going to affect the institutions. They already have lots of revenue. But I think shifting, you know, half a billion dollars around the system is going to have a huge impact. And I, I don't think that's been thought through very well yet. So just to finish up, Chris, if you had a crystal ball and you were to fast forward through to January, how do you how do you see the state of play? Wow. Well, it's going to be really interesting, isn't it? I think the first issue will be whether the accord panel includes this as a recommendation or not. We don't know. If they don't, it's dead. And that will be an interesting kind of little thought bubble that's happened and, and vanished. If it does get proposed, then that's going to put the government in a really difficult position and there will be a lot of opposition to it. I think at the moment, because it's been just floated and nobody knows how serious it is, I don't think there's been any concerted campaign against it so far, but I think that opposition will be pretty fierce, both from the the major institutions that recruit international students, but also from the students themselves, I think, who've been fairly quiet up until now, I think won't be quiet if this is being seriously considered by the government. And so it's going to be, if that happens, it's going to be a very interesting summer. And I think it'll also depend on which other elements of the recommendations are dependent upon this bucket of money appearing. And so it may be that some things which they're proposing are dependent upon this, which would have to be dropped. And, you know, then that's going to be fascinating to see where the, what the proposal is for how this money would be spent and who's invested in, in the levy appearing for that reason. Yeah. yeah, I think it goes back to the point that Rob and I were discussing earlier around, you know, there's four reviews. They're all going to come down fairly shortly. How are they actually going to drop in a way that will be an integrated kind of way right across the government spectrum. So I think you're absolutely on the mark there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a, a busy time for policy development, but also a messy time. And to see how the, all these things are going to get integrated and who's going to do that integration of all these different proposals and, and manage the whole of the reform process, that's it's going to be fun to watch. Lots of popcorn will be bought. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah.
Well, Chris, awesome having you on the podcast. Thanks, as always. And uh, I think we'll be great to get you back sometime early in the year once we have the outcomes of this accord process to maybe have a bit more of a deep dive into what that means for all of us. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks, guys. And Dirk, as always, a pleasure. Thank you for, for the news. Thank you, Ron. And for those of you for those of you listening along, the koalanews.com is your source of international education news here in Australia. Jump on, make sure you subscribe. And until next time, gentlemen, thanks thanks as always. See you again soon. See you guys. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com.au. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.